the TTH YouTube channel. <laughs> Thank you for coming back. But we're going to talk about sort of five things that you should be talking to a nutritionist about during yeah. a consultation. Either questions you should be asking or feedback you should be expecting in a nutritional consultation. Kind of what to expect from a nutritional consultation. Yeah, I guess. so you can get the most out of it because it's like the more you can give them, the more they can give you back if you go in not really knowing why you're there, it's quite hard to then gauge what like, you're trying to yeah. provide them. So if you go in with a little bit of an idea of what you're expecting, then they can really help give you a little bit more feedback on that. And also I think this is really important when it comes to getting kind of any kind of dietary advice. A lot of people turn to sort of macro calculators online or um, what other people are eating or what other people are doing. It can is, work, yeah. but on the whole, it can be a risky business. <laughs> every single person is different. Um, so every single person, you know, we, we're not saying that every single person should go and book a nutritional consultation. No. But what we are saying is you should seek advice um, if you are looking to kind of make changes or improve your diet, improve your general well-being, whatever it might be. So we're going to cover the sort of five things that you should cover during your yeah. consultation or when seeking advice. Number one is your medical history. So it may be something that's quite easy to overlook, but not only yourself, but also within your family. So if there's high rates of so like breast cancer, say, or anything like that, or um, colon disease or things like that, within your family, you need to let your nutritionist know. Because even though it's not something you're suffering with, if you're at risk from this certain um, methods that you can apply to your diet which will help reduce your risk and there's also things that they might suggest which will be healthy to other people but in your case actually will be quite damaging so it's really really important that you give them as much background on your family history and your own history as well and I know that can be a little bit terrifying a little bit scary and not the nicest thing to delve <laughs> into but we promise it's definitely worth going into and your nutritionist will Definitely, or whoever you seek advice from, as long as they're a qualified nutritionist, qualified in the area dietitian, um, they will be able to offer you some sort of solid advice and put your worries at ease. Number two is intolerances and allergies. And oh my, is there a mindful of information around this one. So first thing first, we are going to break down the differences between allergies, intolerances, and also just dislikes. Like, I could tell everyone I was allergic to mushrooms. And I'm tomatoes. not. And tomatoes. And asparagus. <laughs> I'm secretly a very fussy eater. Um, but I'm just not. They're just dislikes. So, we want to break down and kind of talk about the differences so that you guys are a little bit clearer on them. So, if you do go seek advice or do go have a consultation, you're kind of a bit cleared up. So, an allergy is where you have a reaction to a food or a substance that you, you've eaten. Um, so, that's something like a peanut allergy, which actually is why it's so different because peanuts are not a nut, they're a legume. Um, so, it's where your body reacts, so it starts to release histamine. That's why people take antihistamine to help alleviate the swelling, etc. Um, so, yeah, it's something where your body will react to it and have a an aggressive reaction or even quite a minor one. Some people it would be like eczema or swelling of the tongue, different, different kind of things. And intolerance is where your body cannot digest it, so it gets stuck, basically. Um, so it's not broken mm. down in the, well, not stuck in the sense, but it's not broken down in the um, stomach or in the intestines. So it basically starts to ferment, that's why it causes bloating, gas. <laughs> um, we all so get yeah, it, guys, not, we all get it. You're not allergic to it, you're intolerant. So they're two different ones. If you do find you're reacting or um, or s sort of like that certain foods are causing you certain issues, um, then definitely make note of those and make sure you mention those to your nutritionist yeah. so that she can um, either, he or she rather, yeah. can um, either exclude them from your diet or uh, introduce alternatives yeah. or whatever that might be. It's just quite important not to self-diagnose it because a lot of people are going dairy and gluten free, which is, it's fine, but they're not actually intolerant. So then when they exclude it from their diet, when they then suddenly do eat it, they're like, oh, it makes me feel so ill. But that would happen with anything. If you didn't eat fresh fruit for like two weeks, when you suddenly eat an apple, it would be like, oh, that's really acidic. It wouldn't yeah. sit well. It doesn't mean you're intolerant to apples. Um, so before you remove really big food groups, <laughs> like bread and lots of grains, and including many dairy, dairy products, that are really good. Well, they taste good, but they're also really good for you. So if you don't have to omit them from your diet, then there's no problem including them. So don't start hacking out food groups until you've spoken with your nutritionist, dietitian, or your doctor. Number three is cravings, likes, dislikes. This is where the fun bit starts Indeed. because this is where you suddenly realise that you're mildly addicted to a certain type of protein ball. <laughs> 
or mini marshmallows or mini marshmallows <laughs> or mini eggs all of yeah, you, you i'm now addicted to mini eggs <laughs> <as well. laughs> um those are my cravings uh nice. through and through every day without a doubt i definitely eat mini eggs mini marshmallows and a one ball every single day <laughs> <laughs> Something we're I working surrender. on. <laughs> so it's really important again that you let your nutritionist or dietitian know because if it's something that you're going to to crave and that you're going to want, it's important they work around it and they either provide you with alternatives if it's something quite bad, they like smoking, <laughs> so trying to like find another way to replace it or alcohol. But if it's something less sinister like crisps, but you're having a packet a day. That really does add up. So they'll give you alternatives and also days and, and a volume that is acceptable to eat it in. Because um, there's no point to being like, you can never eat that again. Because food shouldn't be good or bad, but there should be a spectrum on how often you consume them. As a proportion, so when we say we have mini eggs every day, it's not an entire bag. I mean, sometimes it is. <laughs> it's like more often than not, it's just two or three. You know, it's yeah. yogurt or when you go into the fridge to get out your greens, just a mini egg yeah. to Which balance is, it out. There's nothing wrong with and That's way better than not having it and then binging on three bags of mini eggs and a pack of galaxy or whatever that's yeah, way yeah. worse and then and a really bad mental relationship with your food as well so yeah make sure you talk to your nutritionist about what you crave and the things you really love also definitely always choose dairy milk over galaxy <laughs> <laughs> number four is your daily routine now despite what all of you might think uh, Emily and I are two different people, which means we have two different daily routines. Um, well, that comes down to sleep, that comes down to meal timings, comes down to meal sizes, comes down to snacking and preference, and preference as well. Um, so despite looking very similar and doing the same thing a lot of the time, our daily routines are actually totally different and it's definitely something that you should be aware of and, and, and seek advice about because yeah. there will be certain things similar to the sort of cravings and um, dislikes and likes that suit your lifestyle or your diet. Definitely. I think breakfast is one of the biggest ones for us. So straight away I either have to train and then eat cause, or I eat when I wake up. I cannot hold... As soon as I'm like available to eat, <laughs> I have to eat breakfast. <laughs> Whereas you're quite happy to sort of yeah. let the morning go a little bit and have breakfast more around even like 10 sometimes, which yeah. I cannot do. <laughs> also, if I'm, I tend to, I work from an office two days a week, so sometimes I'll train at like 6.30 and by the time I've had a shower, got changed, got on the tube, got across to work, it might be 9, 9.30 by the time I've actually sat down at my desk and then, you know, sitting down at your desk is one thing and then having the time to eat your breakfast is another thing. So sometimes that it does tick over. I am kind of always trying to have something else in my bag, like a snack or something, so that I'm not going too long after, especially if I've done a big session after training. Um, I'll have something quick, and even though it might not be like the substantial breakfast I want at that point, at least I'm getting something into my body. Um, but yeah, I am slightly better at holding off on breakfast than Emily is. Um, but oh. actually, similarly, if like I'm not exercising in the morning and I wake up, I, I do quite like the to eat worst thing is we can't lie in the weekend. Well, yeah. I'm the worst because I'm so hungry. Yeah. <laughs> and also, the other thing I guess is, and, and this is definitely not a substitute for a meal, but it, it could be a, a reason that why we differ is that I drink coffee. So in the morning, I'm quite happy like to get up and I have a coffee, which will like keep me okay for like 20 minutes or so. <laughs> um, so, and it's almost like that it's that kind of routine or autopilot thing. So Ems will get up and have breakfast, whereas I'll get up and make coffee first and I'll have my breakfast kind of with my coffee or whatever, so. Yeah. I think other important things that is also shift work. So because for us, the majority of people are always suggest three meals a day, sometimes four, like for you, you work out smaller four. meals, but that's three, four meals a day with two to three snacks, really. Yeah. It's the main, like, bulk of the general population. But there are people who work on shift work or who have different sleeping patterns, etc. So for some people, especially, um, yeah, working, um, through the night, they might only actually have two meals. They'll be bigger meals because they won't have the time. So they'll wake up, have a meal before they start their shift, do their main shift. Maybe they'll have a meal in the middle, or they have one when they get home because they're not actually awake for that long. Yeah. Um. So that's fine. They still might be getting the same amount of calories and same amount of nutrients. So you have to be really focused on that. But it just they don't have the time or the capacity to be able to have three meals and the luxury of having yeah. snacks because it's not. Say they have work in the environment where food isn't allowed into factory yeah. or whatever or hospitals or whatever it is. And yeah. also, for example, personal trainers uh, tend to be up kind of in the very early hours of the morning. Tend to have six a.m. clients. Um, I know certainly our coach yeah. tends to get up about half past four, and so he'll smaller. have smaller meals throughout the day. So he'll probably end up having kind of like five or six meals, but it's just so that he can fit them in in between clients. Like full, yeah, like a, a bit yeah. of And he's on his feet all day, and, and obviously he trains himself, so it's just what suits him. 
Number five is your daily energy expenditure. Now this is a funny one to look at because a lot of people have very different ideas of their daily energy expenditure um, against what, what the reality of them is. For example, one example of this is that we're very good at using exercise as an excuse to then sit on our bums for the rest of the day. <laughs> so if we got up and trained really early, then we're working from home, we're like, oh, well, we can sit down all day now because we've trained in the morning, and then we realise that actually we haven't moved for like eight yeah. or nine hours, which is just crazy. And, and it's not only that we shouldn't just be moving for the sake of exercise or or feeling like we've done something, it's actually really good for, for your body in general to get up and move. We definitely use our Fitbits um, to remind us to get up and move. Even if it's just going to make yeah, your tea. Sometimes it's it not free and it's like, like, you've got seven steps in the next hour. I'm like, I've got this. Sometimes it's like, you have seven minutes to get 200 steps. I'm yeah. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also a lot of people don't realise how long they sit down for. Yeah, so one when I work with clients I get them to write a list of the main activities that they do in the day so for most people it'll be sleeping sitting walking um, and being active and you've got to write down how many hours you spend at each and it's got to make up 24 hours because what else are you doing in the day so for some people I don't know if they worked in a very tall building they might also add going upstairs and <laughs> they spend a long time going upstairs but you write down the main activities that you spend with it and that has to add up to 24 so I'm even so guilty of it that I'll be like oh I'll only sit maximum eight hours a day yeah. but if I realize like, I sleep for seven and a half or whatever I exercise for one two hours and walking for one two sitting is a huge portion of your day that you don't realize because you're sitting when you're eating you're sitting when you're working. working you're sitting when you watch tv in the evening like yeah really really adds up so it's just being aware um of actually how much energy you are expending every day not saying that you have to do that so you can calculate your total calories and then then macros it's not that it's just being aware of how and much energy you're you saying as well <laughs> yeah <laughs> sitting at a desk for 15 hours a day is not fun no matter what you're doing no. um so yeah, so those are our kind of five main points that we think you should cover when seeking advice, be that with a nutritionist or a dietitian, um, and or hopefully, GP. or your GP, hopefully we've kind of covered everything you guys are thinking of, but if there's anything you want to add, then make sure you comment below, um, <laughs> or if there's something you'd like us to do an Instagram live on, or, um, yeah. or a Facebook live, then we can definitely organise that, so again, comment below, let us know, um, and we will see you very soon. Don't forget to subscribe and give us a little thumbs up. It means the world to us. <laughs>